Let's turn our Bible to the book of Luke chapter 2. Last week we preached from Luke chapter 2 as well. But Luke chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. Luke chapter 2 verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for, him, for them in the inn. I read a story this week about this. Of course, in every one of those Christmas plays, of course, you have, you know, you have Mary and Joseph going to the, going to the inn and the innkeeper coming and saying there's no room for you. And I read about two boys that were in the play. The boy that was picked to be the innkeeper wanted to be Joseph because Joseph had a bigger part. As the innkeeper, he only had one thing to say. We don't have any room. You can sleep in the stable. And he didn't like that part. He wanted to be Joseph. And so it came to the night of the play. Been to all the rehearsals and everything. And this boy decided that he was going to be different. And so Mary and Joseph knocked on the door and he opened the door. They said, we're, we're looking for a room. He said, sure, come on in. <laughs> the other boy was pretty sharp, though. He walked in, looked around, and said, this is a dump. We must stay in the barn. <laughs> anyway, verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. I want to bring a message this morning entitled, What If Christ Had Not Been Born? Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. I beg you again this morning for the filling of the Holy Ghost of God that as I preach, your word will go forth in power. If there's any here without Christ as their Savior, may they clearly see their need for the Son of God and turn to Christ and be saved today. Deal with believers today. This Christmas time, may we allow you to do survey of our lives to show where we've not lived this last year as we should in glorifying the Son of God. Lord, I pray that there'd be Christians getting right with you and wanting to serve you. Have your way in every life, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you know it or not, but this year is the 71st or 75th anniversary of the well-known Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Now, most of you have probably seen it once or twice. Some of you, it is your yearly Christmas flick to see. Others have not seen it the first time, and that's okay too. But 75 years ago, that thing was made, and believe it or not, when it went out to be shown in theaters, it ended up being a big flop. Hardly anybody went to see it. It was terrible. From what I've read, Jimmy Stewart thought that the reason it was such a flop was Donna Reed. But... She was basically an unknown at that time. I think this was either her first or second film. Anyway, that has nothing to do with the story. But many people have seen it. And, and the reason being, in the 1970s, when, the, um, when it became public domain, especially in 1974, so TV stations have not had to pay to re-show it, to re-show it, to re-show it, uh, it has become a staple, shown many, many times on several different stations. So a lot of people have seen this thing over and over and over again. And, of course, you remember the, the star of the show, Jimmy Stewart, plays a part of a man who thinks he was doing all he could to simply eke out a living, trying to get ahead just a little bit, and suddenly it seems like everything falls apart. 
It looks like everything's going to be ruined, and he goes to the to the uh, where the bridge is at to throw himself off the bridge. He's going to commit suicide, and an angel comes down, talks him out of it. Uh, it gets pretty wet, but nevertheless, uh, it, he says, "Oh, I wish I'd never been born." So the angel decides to grant his wish that he had never been born, so he could see what it had been like if he had never come around. Well, obviously. None of his friends would have known who he was. He wouldn't have married the gal that he married if he'd never been born because you can't marry if you don't get born sometime. Isn't that right? And uh, you, you know the story. I don't need to tell you the whole story. He just realized that, hey, I guess I did have a pretty wonderful life after all. Now, I only bring that up to think about the thought that I want you to get from this passage. We have a great announcement here from heaven that Christ the Savior is born. Thank God he was born. He was born exactly according to the scripture. What if Christ had never been born? You know that word if is a big word. You know it appears over 1,400 times in the word of God. It's used in a number of different places. For instance, the devil used it several times in the temptation of Christ. If thou be the son of God. All three times he said if thou. And then the man asking for healing in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 2 said, If thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. Jesus said it in John chapter 12. He said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. In John chapter 16, Jesus said, If I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 said, If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. What if... Christ had not been born. Let me give you just a few thoughts on that. Number one, all the promises of God about a coming Redeemer would be broken. He had promised a Redeemer way back in the Old Testament, and this is the key. He had told them over and over again that he was sending his son and that his, sin was, and his son was going to suffer for their sins so that we could have forgiveness of sins and even prophesied that he would be raised from the dead. Turn over to Luke chapter 24 just a moment. Luke chapter 24. And notice on resurrection day, the Bible says beginning in verse 13 of Luke chapter 24, and behold two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. It came to pass that while they were communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, Answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and to have crucified him. And we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them, which were with us, went to the sepulcher, and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now that must have been a wonderful Bible conference to be a part of. To hear the Lord Jesus Christ opened the scripture and showed them over and over again the things that were done to him that God had said would be done to the Redeemer, to the Christ, the one that God would send. I mean, the scripture told of the line that he would come through. 
Even in Matthew chapter 1, it begins, the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He had to come through the line of Abraham and the line of David. The work that he would do, Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That was written 700 years before Jesus came to the cross. That he'd be raised from the dead. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 2, that's the subject of Peter's message on the day of Pentecost. He quotes from Psalm 16. God had prophesied that his body would not see corruption, but that he would be raised from the dead just as he said. When Peter was winning the household of Cornelius to Christ, he said in Acts chapter 10 to him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. I'm just simply saying if Christ hadn't been born, then all the promises concerning the coming Christ would have been left unfulfilled a lie. And you say, preacher, what would that mean? Well, let me show you. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And notice, he says, after all, if he'd never been born, that meant he wouldn't have died. Had he not died on the cross and rose from the dead, here's what would have happened. He says in verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. And ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only... We have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. Do you realize it would mean that if Christ was not born, that our sins have not been paid for? We are still under the sentence of death with no hope of getting to heaven whatsoever. If Christ had not been born, then every man, woman, boy, or girl would end up in a sinner's hell burning throughout all eternity. For the wages of sin is death. And only the truth that Christ came, that he was born, that he died for our sins, he was raised from the dead three days later. Only that truth gives us assurance that eternal life is found in Jesus Christ. So if Christ had not been born, Old Testament prophecies concerning a Savior would have been left unfulfilled. Number two, if Christ had not been born, we could never know the full character of God. Never. For the Bible says, for in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. In Roman, John chapter 14, beginning in verse 8. Philip looked at Jesus on the night before the crucifixion and he said, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Jesus answered and said unto him, Have I been so long time with you and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then show us the Father? You see, absolutely, had he not been born, then we could never know the fullness of the character of God. Turn over to John chapter 1 a moment if you would. John chapter 1. I want you to notice these powerful verses concerning Jesus. He says in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. You might underline this. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Now skip down to verse 14. This word who was God, notice it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Thank God, because Christ was born, we can know God in his 
fullness. In Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 19, the Bible says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Yes, you can know his eternal power and Godhead, but you cannot know God in his fullness without Jesus Christ. Thank God that he was born in Bethlehem. Thank God he fulfilled the scriptures. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and just turn over there. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I actually want to start reading a little bit earlier than verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Notice the scripture says, beginning in verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, or God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, even though we've just gone through a series of messages on the wickedness of Calvinism, I want you to notice again the words that he's given us here. He says in verse 4, who will have all men to be saved. It does not say all the elect. It says all men. God wants all men to be saved. Jesus came and died for the world. All men. And then he says in verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all. Not for some. Not for part of the population. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. We're not going to play with the word of God. We're not going to change the very clear words that God said and that Christ said. We believe it as he said it, that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He died for all. The Bible says he is the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, either it means what it says or throw your Bible away. If it doesn't mean what it says, then you've got a book that is just a guessing game. Thank God he was born. We could never know the fullness of character without that. So if he'd not been born, all Old Testament promises of God would be broken. We could never know the fullness of the character of God. And by the way, the world would have to still be waiting for a Savior. What helplessness. Think of the deaths throughout the world. Now, let's face it. Regardless of how you feel about COVID, the reality is a few million people died from COVID. And whether it was really COVID or they got something else and it was marked down as COVID, they're still dead. Do you get that? No matter what caused it, if COVID caused it, something else caused it, hospital air caused it, or whatever, they're still dead. But I got news for you. There were a lot more people than 2 million that died during 2021. As a matter of fact, you've got almost a a city almost the size of Huntsville that are dying every week around the world. People die at the rate of almost 2 a minute. Or to a second, I'm sorry, not to a minute, to a second. Now you figure it out, you multiply that out, that comes to an awful lot of people that are dying. And if Christ hasn't come yet, what would people have to look forward to? But death, Bible says in Ephesians 2, 11 and 12, wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. No hope. See, if Christ didn't come, we have no hope. There would be no hope of heaven. If you have no hope of heaven, then eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. The promises of God aren't true. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. But you see, they are true. Christ died. He died for our sins. He was buried. He rose three days later from the dead. 
so that Paul could victoriously say, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Amen. What a marvelous promise. Several years ago, there were some 34 men that went down in a submarine off Provincetown, uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts. Rescuers came from all over. The only means of communication at that time, this is way back in like 1925, the only means of communicating with those trapped inside was by tapping. And they had people come, but they didn't have the salvage expertise that we have today. And they didn't have the communication that we have today. And they thought everybody probably died. What happened was another ship hit that submarine, number S-51. And... Uh, they heard tapping, so they realized some people must still be alive in there. That tapping went on for 48 hours. And then eventually the tapping stopped. They couldn't get it up fast enough. Those all died. And when they'd ask, are they coming to save us soon? They would get the reply back, no. No. Imagine sitting there with absolutely no hope whatsoever. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 10 and 11, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. When Paul was seeking God about where to go to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the answer was sent in a dream. A man from Macedonia appeared unto him and said, Come over and help us. If Christ had not been born, the answer could have only been, There was no one to help you. Hope comes only in Jesus Christ. If Jesus had not been born, there'd be no gospel message to preach. There had been nothing to say. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But for that to take place, he had to be born. If he had not been born, here's what that means to me. Here's what it means to my family. Here's what it means to Mike Allison and Jan Allison and our children, Carrie and Kathy. You see, the Allisons for years were a bunch of drinkers and cursers. I don't know how far that goes back, but I'm sure it had gone back quite a quite a ways, but we grew up in a home, as I mentioned many times, of drinking and cursing. It was common for us to hear the name Jesus Christ in our home, but it was always as a curse word. There are a lot of homes like that today where the awfulest of language is used, the cursing and the cussing that goes on. Thank God, thank God that Christ did come, but for years I knew nothing about him. I can remember when I almost drowned, I was probably about 10 years of age, and I almost drowned, and when my dad came out and rescued me and then promptly set me in the car and uh, left me there in the car and said, think about it, and I sat there and thought about it, and all I could think of was darkness. I mean, I had no hope of heaven. I had no knowledge of heaven. I had no knowledge of how to get to heaven. There was no hope whatsoever. But in 1971, just a few weeks before Christmas, I got saved. Man, that changed Christmas time for me. Now, since all we had known about Christmas growing up was Santa Claus, that's all we had known. That's all we had heard. I mean, it was that and getting presents. See, there's a reason why we don't have any Santa Claus here. We don't do any Santa Claus for the bus kids because Santa Claus, I don't want to shock you now, not real. He doesn't know whether you're naughty or not. You get that? The Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above. Cometh down from the Father of lights, and who is no variableness, neither shadow or turning. Uh, listen, we got saved, and of course, we got saved just before we had our first daughter. So our children have only known Christmases with Christ as Lord and Savior. What a wonderful, wonderful truth. We not only got hope in finding Christ as our Savior. 
But we also found a purpose for life, a purpose for living, to live for the eternal one to tell others about him, to see others come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Before, when I thought of death, it was darkness, but today it's light, it's eternity. And the reality is, I can't wait to see him. I mean, it may be today. And I'm going to see him one of two ways. Either this body's going to quit functioning and I'm going to be released to heaven which is hallelujah, or he's coming back and I'm going to hear the sound come up hither and I'm out of here. And if you're saved, you'll be out of here too. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. Because he came, the promises of God are true. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them give you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Because he came, they're true. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. See, the promises are true. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Then he says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Or as Jesus said at the graveside of Lazarus, he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that were dead, uh, he, let's see, he that believeth, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Amen. What a marvelous promise. Some of you have heard some of the story of Ira Sankey. Ira Sankey was a, he wrote a lot of gospel songs. He was sung at a lot of revivals. He sung at a lot of revivals that were held by D.L. Moody in the last half of the 1800s. And uh, matter of fact, he was in the Union Army in, um, joined in 19, I'm sorry, 1860. Anyway, I read this story in one of the books about him uh, that in 1875, he was on a steamboat going up the Delaware, Delaware River. And some people recognized him, and they asked him if he would sing a song. It was at Christmas time, so he thought about singing a Christmas song. But just before he started, he changed his mind, and he decided to sing what they knew then as the Shepherd's Song. Now, we don't use that title today. We use Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, which is the first line of the song. And it goes this way, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, Much We Need Thy Tenderest Care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us, for our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us, thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us, thine we are. And then he sang the other two verses. When he was done singing, he was a tremendous singer. When he was done singing, it was just quiet. And a hush was over the group that was around him. In that deep stillness, a man walked up to him, had kind of a weathered face, and uh, he came up to Ivor Sankey and he said, Sir, were, did, did, were you in the Union Army during the Civil War? He said, Yes, I joined in 1860. He said, Well, in 1862, were you standing watch uh, in 1862 uh, doing picket duty on a very bright moonlit night? And Sankey was kind of surprised because he remembered that time, and he said, well, yes, I did. He said, well, sir, I, I served in the Confederacy. And he says, on that night in 1862, I saw you. I had snuck up on the camp. And I thought, well, there's a soldier boy that I could take out to the fight. And he said, I trained my rifle right on you. He said, and you started singing that very song, Savior like a shepherd lead us. He said, after you sang the first line, I decided that you could wait till I heard the rest of it <laughs> before you died. After all, you might as well do one last thing in your life. And so I listened to it. But as I got to listening to you sing that song, he said, I got to thinking about my mama because she loved that song and she used to sing it a lot. And when you got to the end of the song, my arms just went limp. And he said, I couldn't shoot you. 
And I said, there's a young man that got to live longer tonight. He said, but I heard you sing tonight. I recognized your voice. I remembered that evening. He said, sir, even though I had a godly mom, I got away from God during the war, and I've been away from him ever since. My life has just been miserable, and I got reminded of how much my mother loved the Lord. And I'd like to know him tonight. Could you help me? Ira Sankey said, I sure can. He put his arm around his shoulder. They walked off away from the others. And there he led that man to Jesus Christ. What if Christ had not come? I read about a man by the name of John Callahan. John Callahan was from New York City, but he ended up traveling over much of the country in different places. John Callahan was a wicked man. Wicked man. It seemed like he was in trouble almost all of the time. As a matter of fact, he was put in Joliet Penitentiary over in Illinois. And in the penitentiary, when he finally got out, he was encouraged by, by the warden to go straight. He said, I told the warden that I would go straight, but he said, later that night, about 12 hours after my release, I finally returned home drunk. He ended up becoming a bartender. Got into a fight, struck a man, put back in jail at another prison. He ended up going through his life like that. He was known by the police force wherever he stayed as a man who was just simply full of trouble. Well, one night, he found himself stopping at a rescue mission. He heard the gospel message, and he came forward and got saved. And he just couldn't wait to tell other people about Jesus Christ. He decided, as he had given his life to Christ, see, it was one of those salvations that I think is supposed to be the norm. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, he definitely became a new creature, and he wanted to serve the Lord, but he realized that in the four prisons that he eventually had been in, that they had pictures of their prisoners back then, uh, kind of a rogues gallery that he, he had pictures in four prisons. He went to three of them and was able to get his picture given back to him by the prison. He went to Joliet Prison and they said they couldn't give it to him. It was going to be stuck there. Well, one day he was traveling with Harry Monroe and they went to the Battle Creek Sanitarium where they were presenting Christ. There was a special thing going on and the governor of Illinois heard John Callahan's testimony of the difference Christ had made in his life. And Callahan talked about going to those three prisons and getting his picture off that wall. And, but he couldn't get it off the wall at the prison at Joliet in Illinois. The governor came up to him afterwards and he said, he said, I really appreciated your testimony of salvation and he says, I'm going to get back with you, but let me see what I can do about your picture up on that wall. About a week or so later, John Callahan got a letter from the governor of Illinois. And here's what the letter said. It said, it gives me pleasure to enclose your photograph from the penitentiary of Joliet and to tell you that your record of crime has been destroyed. There is no record except in your memory that you were ever here, signed the governor of Illinois. For many years, he did a great work for God, spent the rest of his life bringing people to the Savior. But if Christ had not been born, he would have been stuck with a wasted life, a lifetime of trial and trouble and misery. Thank God Christ was born. And he came to die on an old rugged cross to pay our sin debt. That precious blood that flowed from his body was blood that was covering our sin. And when he cried out, it is finished. The payment was made. And three days later, he arose from the dead. Yes, he was born. He died. He arose. And he gives eternal life to all that trust him. And I can't think of a better way to live than to live for this one who came for me. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name.
Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for keeping your promises. Thank you for the mighty work that he went through so that all, so that all that believe could have eternal life. Now, Lord, you know who's watching over the Internet right now, and you know who is listening right now in this auditorium. You know who's saved. You know who's lost, who's taken you as Savior and who hadn't. You're not fooled by church clothes. You know exactly whether we're saved or lost. Father, I pray that there'd be some sinner tonight, today, that would decide right now they're going to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Put someone over the internet, God, may they call us here at the church so we can have someone take them through the gospel, show them how to have Christ as Savior. But Lord, right here in the auditorium, all they have to do is respond. You said, but as many as received him, to them give he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. God, may they come to Jesus today, I pray. Have your way in every life, I pleaded in Jesus' name.